Hello and welcome to week three of London in Song and this week we'll be discussing a much better known song, the song Jerusalem which has become the unofficial national anthem of England. The words to the song now known as Jerusalem were written by the poet William Blake in the early years of the 19th century, probably in around about 1804. Blake is one of Britain's great iconoclastic poets, perhaps best known for his songs of innocence and experience for which the poem The Tiger was written. You may know the lines, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Blake lived his entire life in London, apart from a few years that he spent in Felpham in Sussex, an experience which shaped Milton a poem, the uh, work from which the lines ended, those feet in ancient time, is taken. Blake was born in Broad Street, now Broadwick Street in Soho, and died in a house in Fountain Court, just off the Strand on the site now occupied by the Savoy Hotel. For our purposes, it's perhaps interesting to note that Blake's house in Fountain Court was just a few yards away from the Song and Supper Club, the Coal Hole, where W.G. Ross sometimes performed 20 years after Blake's death. Blake was in many ways a, a London poet, but he didn't always much like London. Indeed, he often associated it with poverty, suffering and destitution. In his poem, London, from the Songs of Experience, Blake called the city blighted and plagued and calls our attention to the suffering of infants, prostitutes and chimney sweeps. He protests how the city has enchained its residents, creating what he calls mind-forged manacles that turn them into unthinking slaves to the rules imposed by church and palace. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, Blake writes, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. Notice that what Blake focuses on here, though, is not the way suffering looks, but the way it sounds. In every cry of every man, in every voice, the mind-forged manacles I hear. London provides above all an auditory as much as a visual experience, which is particularly striking when one considers that Blake was first and foremost a visual artist trained as an engraver. Indeed, he made his living as a commercial engraver, most often taking other people's drawings and engraving them so that they could be reproduced in books. Throughout his life, Blake expressed frustration with the fact that he was considered merely a copyist, inferior to the artist that made the original drawings. He rebelled against the logic of original and copy by developing his own artistic mode he called illuminated printing. This printing method involved Blake making several copies of each of his works that he, with the help of his wife Catherine, would then painstakingly hand colour, effectively erasing the distinction between an original and a copy. For a few years between 1800 and 1803, Blake moved away from London to live in a cottage in Feltham, a move that had been made possible by the poet William Haley, who acted as his patron. Blake was initially very excited about his move away from London, which he saw as rending the manacles of London's dungeon dark. I have rent the black net and escaped, he wrote to his friend George Cumberland, once again associating London with being trapped and confined in manacles or handcuffs. Felpham initially promised greater freedom, and he described it as certainly the sweetest country upon the face of the earth. It was, in fact, here, in his cottage in Felpham, which is now unfortunately falling into disrepair, that Blake wrote the preface to Milton that included the lines and did those feet in ancient times, with its description of England's mountains green. But things quickly turned sour. He began to resent Haley who encouraged him to occupy his time with tasks like painting miniature portraits, which had a commercial value, rather than spending time on his own work, which Blake had difficulty selling. A turning point came in 1803, when Blake was tried for treason in Chichester. A soldier had come into Blake's garden, and Blake forcibly ejected him by the elbows, he claimed, uh, escorting him down the street. The soldier, called John Schofield, then accused Blake of assault, and also of using seditious and treasonable expressions. Blake was acquitted, 
but the experience seems to have encouraged Blake to return to London to try his luck again in the city. These experiences fed into Blake's poem Mountain, in which William Haley appears, and Blake also includes an image of his cottage at Felden in the work. A strangely material image for an artist whose usual practice avoids mere representation of earthly forms, as we'll discover in the next video.